Hello and welcome to today's webcast, Building Community Resilience by Reducing Sewer Overflows and Improving Flood Management, brought to you by Waterworld Magazine and sponsored by Innovise, an Autodesk company. My name is Alana Maya. I am Chief Editor for Waterworld and I will be your moderator today. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, the audio, video, and slides for today's presentation will be pushed to your screen automatically. Uh, if you are interested in receiving a PDF of today's presentation, you may reach out to our presenters afterward, and there will be a slide at the end with their contact information um, for that. If you are running pop-up blocking software, we recommend that you disable it to view this webcast. We also recommend that you close down other applications for better performance. Uh, for any technical difficulties, please submit your issue through the Ask a Question box, and a member of our webcast support team will work with you to correct the problem. The Ask a Question box is also how you can submit questions for our presenters, and we'll discuss your questions during the Q&A portion at the end of the program. A certificate of attendance will be issued automatically with, by email within 24 hours of the event, and for your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event, and a reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible for six months at waterworld.com. One final request, your feedback is very important to us and we hope that you'll take a moment to complete a brief satisfaction survey at the end of the broadcast. And now on with our program. We have two terrific presenters for you today. Ryan Brown is systems engineer with Innovise, an Autodesk company. Uh, he has over 10 years of experience in the water, wastewater, and stormwater industry. He has focused on hydraulic modeling for design, analysis, and other digital applications of water, wastewater, and stormwater related data systems for much of that time. Um, Katerina Buchan is a climate resiliency modeler with Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and she is a PhD student at the Concrete Sustainability Hub at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, a joint appointment with MIT Office of Sustainability. Um, and I will turn it over to Ryan now. All right, thanks, Alana. So I guess just uh, diving right into it, um, just as a kind of an overview of the agenda of what I was hoping to cover today, um, you know, just a general overview of really what's driving these initiatives, why we care about being more resilient, um, and the impact on the current systems. Uh, we also have Katya here to uh, talk about some of the climate change models they've been uh, developing and looking at at MIT, uh, some really interesting stuff on uh, just the modeling approach and, and some of the statistical models they've been putting together. Um, then we'll dive into just the benefits and paybacks of these types of systems. Um, and then also uh, take a look at uh, kind of a, a different angle of uh, not necessarily uh, predicting the future, but being more proactive with your um, systems and being able to uh, look at some case studies that will uh, have some um, examples of how that's been uh, successfully uh, deployed. Uh, so just in general, as we've seen, um, you know, climate change is, is exactly that, that, you know, some places are getting wetter, some places are getting drier. Uh, this is a look over the past 115 years of uh, the U.S. and the changes that have been happening in the precipitation, uh, where we're getting a lot more in the Mississippi Valley region and the North uh, East. As you would expect, uh, pretty close correlation to um, some insignificant and significant increases and insignificant and significant decreases in river flooding. Um, in those same areas, uh, in the Mississippi Valley area, you can see uh, some increasing, some in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the uh, Northeast of the United States. Uh, we're not only getting wetter, but we're seeing more uh, in increasing intensities uh, over um, the course of the past 100 years or so. Uh, where we were pretty steady from 1910 up to 1980, but started to see a uh, pretty significant uptick. Um, of course, with that um, comes worse flooding. Um, you can also see uh, this is an example of an area where it's, uh, in roughly 20 years ago, uh, the orange spots representing uh, the impervious area, the green spots representing the uh, per pervious area. Um, if I hit next, you can see that change uh, just to go back and forth once again, just to get an idea, uh, we are getting pretty significant changes in terms of the impervious area, and as a result of that, being able to um, have more runoff from these systems. Um, 
With that, I'll switch it over to Kathy for the next few slides. Yeah. So um, to kind of pick up for where uh, Ryan was going with climate change being insinuated, if we're looking today on uh, what are our, our largest risks for every area around the globe, we can see that um, extreme precipitation events are emerging to be um, the greatest uh, hazards for about 92% of the world. If we combine together four out of the five um, hazard, most hazardous events of the world are rain-driven. And so for my research, I am, um, and that's a portion that I'm gonna be presenting today, we're working on developing a method to accurately predict risks and damages due to pluvial and fluvial flooding in any type of environment. Um, so it's clear that it's a very important topic and it's right on time and we need to have the accuracy of where exactly the flooding is gonna be, especially when we have such growing urban density and so if we're looking at the US, just like Ryan said, we have growing intensities of rain and growing uh, costs for extreme climate events. And if we're looking on just the surface flooding or just the damages um, in cities, we can see that we have um, a large inaccuracy in our knowledge and in our risk uh, awareness where we have a great amount of our city being flooded over and over again in different events, and um, that that puts a strain on our emergency reaction and response, as well as it puts a toll on our roads and the damages that are created, and our roads as well as other infrastructures that we utilize as large in large urban environments are very critical. So I'm bringing here examples for two types of roads. We have um, the flexible pavements, the asphalt, compared to the rigid pavements. And we sometimes see that just the awareness of where the flooding can go can lead to a different decision-making where uh, concrete pavements usually, once water recedes, they really regain back their capacity and their damages are much less um, immediately pronounced, whereas flexible pavements experience dramatic, um, dramatic damages, and especially if they are the only emergency evacuation route, it, it creates um, also a life risk in our communities. Yeah, so just taking a look at some of the data that's been put out there as far as reports and uh, climate vulnerability studies uh, and, and what we can do to address it. Um, there was a report I found that uh, Brown and Caldwell did uh, for the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District just to evaluate some different climate models uh, for the 2050 and 2100 uh, time horizons and just to see what kind of impacts those would have on the SSOs and uh, CSOs. Uh, it was rather interesting, the, the volume of CSOs, um, as you might expect, increased um, as much as 18% for the 2050 and 27%, but they actually decreased for the SSO events. Uh, the big reason and driver behind that was because of uh, the amount of uh, evapotranspiration that was expected in, in the 2050 and 2100 scenarios. Of course, in a combined system, you have the stormwater effects, which is why those increase, but with the SSOs, uh, there just happened to be less um, water getting into the soil. Um, the, Frequency of the SSOs and CSOs tended to be the same during the summer, but they kind of expanded out into the, the fall and the spring time period where uh, we saw, they saw uh, increased uh, frequencies. Um, so you might think, great, you know, we've got some climate studies out there. We've got some information that says um, what's going to happen. Well, not, not exactly true because there's a lot of uncertainty with climate change. Um, uh, the, uh, this uh, pretty interesting article I found uh, that came out uh, just a few months ago um, describes climate change as having deep uncertainty. Uh, and really what that means is there's very little information in understanding uh, the likelihood of what the models are saying. Uh, and the only thing that's really certain is that nothing's certain. Um, basically what it means to be deeply uncertain or deep uncertainty about something is that the parameters to define the model distribution tend to also be uncertain. So there's just a whole lot of uncertainty. Uh, because of that, there's been a lot of approaches to use Monte Carlo and derivatives of it. 
to understand the likelihood of those of what those regional climate uh, models are going to uh, turn out to be. And um, basically what they found is uh, that for raw regional climate models, uh, they should be used with a lot of caution and um, understanding that uh, just because you've run a future scenario uh, based on the climate change model, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be a silver bullet for your uh, solution. So back to Katya. Thank you. So before we dive back to what Ryan was talking about with this climate change and how and what are the inputs that we can change to have those impacts quantified in our simulations. Um, now that we've established how important this is to us to have an accurate knowledge of where the flooding goes and how it propagates within a city, um, I want to dive to kind of see what is the current most, uh, most used approaches and methods and compare it to what is maybe the needed pathway to move forward. And so if we're looking on all the conventional methods to quantify um, the risks and damages due to flooding, we, we see that we have traditional catchments approach for the rain simulation and towards the modeling itself, we have a 1D hydraulics and hydrology flow. And so first of all, Here's a visual on the right of what is traditional catchments visually compared to the rain on mesh. And so when we are in most of the simulations, the rain is simulated in a way where a volume of water is basically plugged in into one point. And from there, the flow itself is drained in the pipe system of the city. And the only way where flood can be captured in that simulation unless of course it's coastal or riverine floods, which we'll get to in a minute, is if that flooding is actually overflowed from the pipes and manholes, um, where the rain on mesh approach simulates an equally spatial distribution of rain and it drains topographically to multiple drains, depends on how and where it gets to those drainage points and also depending on the morphology of the above ground city that we're simulating. Now, once we model um, a traditional catchment approach versus the rain on mesh, we're absolutely gonna be um, neglecting some of our water because at times, for example, we can put the water in one point that is a 72 inch pipe, or we can put it in an eight inch pipe and the reaction of those would be different as well as that approach is basically creating a neglection of the time as a variable in the simulation. Now, when we say the 1D um, hydraulics and hydrology approach, what does that mean? And that means that we're unable to capture fluvial flood risk in the simulation, in the traditional simulation. Now, fluvial Flooding is what we commonly think of when we think of flooding, is when in the middle of a rain-driven event, we have um, an overflow of a river or an ocean tidal, um, and basically we have an infinite amount of water that covers um, whatever elevation it gets to. And that assumption is very, is very reasonable. Well, in pluvial flooding, we have a rain-driven event but we have a finite quantity of water. The thing is that water, although it's finite amount, it could still create a massive amount of damage as we've seen in Ida and Henry last year in New York. So that water um, can flow everywhere and depends on topography, drainage, morphology of the city, it will go wherever it propagates. And so currently, with the way um, our models or our, our methods are built. We are neglecting the time dependence. We're neglecting a huge portion of the, the surface flooding that exists, as well as we're not able to capture the differences in between our buildings or the different state of our buildings, or whether we have underground structures, would they flood, would they not flood, as well as those models simply do not have 
any integration of all the city infrastructures, meaning we're unable to actually simulate our cities and get reasonable, accurate results. Um, our approach is towards developing a new framework that combines machine learning models, high resolution GIS data, and a 2D uh, hydrodynamic flood simulation. So using a lot of layers for the city as the digital elevation models, the river and coastal um, layers, the various uh, urban systems as buildings, as roads, as vegetation areas, and of course the subsurface infrastructure areas, we're using those results after simulating in a large scale in a large scale area to more precisely predict flood damages and propagations in a city. And another portion of the project that I will not be presenting today is our integration of the subsurface facilities or basements and underground uh, structures and how they flood during a rain event. So um, our case study is flooding in the city of Cambridge. And particularly today, I'm gonna to be looking at the surface roads. We have the storm intensity inputs. So I have taken only 24 hours, um, 24 hour storm simulations. And if you can look here on the graph, the blue curve represents NOAA's current prediction for 24 hour storms for the city of Cambridge, going from recurrence of two year recurrence to one in 1000 year rain events. And uh, the blue and green curves represent uh, the results of a climate analyses by Kleinfelder, the city of Cambridge, MIT, Santac, and Dewberry to predict what would be the elevations of the river, the ocean, and different water bodies in and around the city of Cambridge in 2030 and 2070, as well as what are the predicted rainstorm intensities for a 24 hour event then. As, as, and as you can see with, um, our, with our data, we see a, basically just a shift towards intensification of the 24 hour predicted event. So um, how we, um, this all started with the city of Cambridge making a multi-hazard report for FEMA. And they used the various companies and research facilities and MIT has created for itself due to that also the MIT campus flood risk model. And that was all used with the same base model for the city of the city of Cambridge that the city itself used. And once we went on to compare our results, we saw that our results were significantly different. Now, it doesn't really make sense since we've modeled the same type of city exactly, right? Well, the realization was that the city wanted um, to have lower computational costs and they, they were simulating traditional catchments approach while we were doing rain on mesh due to the fact that uh, MIT was simulating a smaller portion of the city at first. And so that brought us to stop and look at the temporal changes in between three types of simulations for the city of Cambridge. In the rest curve, as the bottom, um, the lower bound, we have the traditional catchments approach. For the full city of Cambridge, the rain, only the rain is simulated different. For the rest of the city, we have all the above surface and below surface layers. Then we have the rain on mesh approach, again, with all underground structures and above ground structures, and that is represented in the blue curve. And finally, we've done this, um, this simulation where we simulated rain on mesh with the same uh, storms. Up all, for all three uh, events, we have exactly the same storm event simulated and presented here. And so the last one, we had no representation of the subsurface system, meaning I had no, um, no sewer or drainage at all. And so the results were quite, quite shocking. We saw that uh, in reality, the traditional catchments approach would lead us to only 2.3% 
of the city area flooded and 5% of the roads of the city flooded, while the rain on mesh with the full um, city topography and subsurface systems would lead to 17% of the area of the city being flooded. And we uh, separated low flood from deep flood, and this percentages here are only representing areas, elements that were flooded with over one feet of water during the simulation so that we won't have any noise or just puddles uh, being represented here. So it seems that both on the temporal level and, pro and on the maximum flooding level, the traditional catchment approach is unable to capture the complexity or the extent of the flooding. And now looking at this on a visual, we can see on the right side, a portion of the city of Cambridge with the surface flooding from the traditional catchment simulation. Here I'm showing the upper bound, uh, the rain on mesh simulation without underg underground structures. This is already leading to a quite massive uh, surface flooding across the city, or at least across this portion, which is a little lower than the rest of the city. And the rain on mesh uh, simulation that is the most accurate and has the highest resolution of data and inputs has um, this type of flooding. Once we overlay our results, the traditional catchments on top of the rain on mesh with underground structures, we can visually see the area change between the captured floodings. And while in some way the the, the flooding is similar in both, we can still see full streets or full areas that have no representation in the traditional catchments. And for a large city, that could be crucial, especially on the evacuation and just knowledge. So from this um, analysis, we basically concluded two things. One is the complexity of rain matters. Rain matters. The simulation method of the rain was significantly more impactful on our surface flooding than the representation, and might I say costly representation, of the whole subsurface system of a city. And why I say costly is because it's data that is very hard to aggregate and put together in one single model for a full city. And the second, second uh, is that our upper bound might be an exaggeration or an overprediction of the flooding. However, its error is at a much lower percentage than the traditional catchment versus the rain on mesh. And um, the low resolution data that was required for that simulation is easily obtainable for most of the US. So, Moving forward from the temporal changes within a single event, looking at the traditional catchments versus rain on mesh, we wanted to see how our changing climate is impacting, or basically how we perceive the difference in the propagation of the surface flooding in the city in different um, rain intensities or throughout the years. And so we, um, for the climate change impacts, we not only changed the, the rain intensity that we plugged in into the 24-hour event, but we also changed the elevations of the tide coming to the harbor, the elevation of the Charles River passing um, adjacent to the city of Cambridge, and um, other surface and subsurface streams of water around it, so that we have the most impactful representation of events. Of course, that's excluding any um, physical structural changes that the city will be passing in the last, in the next 20, 30 years. So this is a result showing you uh, the visual change between the one in 100 year uh, storm today. And on the right side, you see the same storm in 2017. Now, this is a zoom in to the same area that I've used before, just so we visually see that. And 
while the storms themselves vary in a three inch so the one in 100 year today is 8.16 inches and the one in 100 year in 2070 is predicted to be only 11.2 inches i say that only because it's such it's relatively a smaller change than the change we see on the screen which means that it's very important for us to be able to even when we go into the band of uncertainty and into the prediction world, to be able to capture as much of the first order impact on our flooding as we can, because neglecting them might lead to a very inaccurate result. Moving forward, we focused on the flood propagation in between rain intensities. As we've seen in the one in 100 year changes, those changes are captured even within the 24 hour storms today. So the curve over here is showing you the area of the city that is the road area of the city that is flooded. And on, um, on the X scale, you see the intensity or the cumulative rain within the 24 hour event. And that spans from 2.5 inches of rain up all the way to 19.3 inches of rain. And we can definitely see both of the curve is nonlinear, but also that it seems to be tapering slightly in its intensity once the flooding is really um, massive. So on the right is just a visual of how it increases once I go from the two year to the 10 year recurrence to the 100 year to the one in 1000 year, where a massive amount, 30% of the city roads is a massive amount enough that one, we know we won't have enough pumps to secure, securely evacuate all the people. And two, we might not even have access to reach people to evacuate them or to assist. And that led us to the final uh, portion that I'm gonna that I'm going to be showing today, and that's our initial findings for the road flood risk map that we're making for the city of Cambridge. Now, in this, um, we want to allow for a, a larger accessibility of data and result data to both governance and private stakeholders. And for that, we wanted to develop uh, or to bring in more information and more result information um, in, in a, an easy map way or attribute way in a table. So today I'm gonna to be showing you the road flood risk probability heat map and the long flooded road heat map. So from the 10 um, predicted rainstorms events today for the city of Cambridge, I um, compiled a heat map that is showing the probability of every road segment along the city that does get flooded, it shows the probability of it to be flooded annually. And that probability is going from 0.001 to 0.5. And that's an annual probability. Um, and of course, all the segments we're taking were above one feet of water um, for when they were taking, and that leads to the next map. And well, time matters. And as I said before, if we want to have temporal changes and we know that they matter, for roads, for example, when a segment of road is flooded above four hours, this is where we know that we start accumulating damage to both the surface of the roads and the subsurface of the roads because there start to be, um, there start to be penetration of the water through the asphalt into the soil layers and there's starting to be a washout of, the, of those layers. So we've identified, um, again, on the same heat map, what segments of roads along in the city of Cambridge would be flooded for more than four hours in a 24 hour event, matching the previous probability heat map. Um, so moving forward, we want to quantify the expected damages to the city we want to do this for the city roads, including damages from a single rain event using machine learning uh, models. 
And uh, we want to incorporate that with uh, manhole failure along the city. We want to be able to give this data to the city in a, in a city scale format. So not being very local, but being, um, being large scale and being able to do the analysis on the single structure scale or the single road segment scale. And finally, our goal is to be able to expand to the Northeast and beyond. Now I'm bringing it back to, the, to Ryan. All right, thanks Katia, that was great. Um, so really, why are we talking about all this? Why are we doing all this research? Um, why are we uh, trying to do this? Uh, but really just being able to use this kind of data to uh, really protect the environment, uh, prevent flooding, you know, understand what's going to happen with different and more intense uh, types of uh, rain events, uh, and also preserve life uh, through both, um, like Katya was mentioning, you know, being able to actually get to people as well as uh, folks that might be in the place of danger uh, because of where they work. Um, be smarter about how we're managing our, our water using smart ponds and things like that. Uh, and retractable flood walls, um, as well as uh, flow warning systems. Um, some other benefits um, um, to being a little more proactive with things, uh, being able to I identify blockages, um, really having a payback on, on your system, um, and then this, uh, um, this big one, you know, having advanced warning for floods, um, and understanding what that can mean uh, really show a huge uh, potential savings uh, annually from being able to uh, optimize reservoir operations uh, as well as reducing short-term and long-term floods. Um, you know, the method of, of being able to do this is, is a holistic modeling approach, being able to um, build out uh, networks efficiently and uh, using things like RTCs to control gates and weirs and uh, different flow paths and things like that. Also, data management, um, you know, keeping track of everything and making sure you're understanding where it's coming from, uh, and then being able to also analyze that results in a uh, time-efficient manner as well as um, being able to view things in an informative way that makes sense and is going to uh, ultimately help you. Um, you know, we've hit a lot on, you know, these different climate change models and things like that, um, and Sure, there's ways of being able to plan for 50 and 100 year, but hopefully we've kind of sown the seed that uh, there is a lot of uncertainty with these climate change models. Um, and so kind of a different approach um, that I've started to kind of hint at is, is just being more proactive about things. Um, and in order to do that, being timely about it, uh, being accurate with it, uh, being reliable with it, and then also being adaptable as things change in the system. Um, a big component of being able to do something like this uh, and be more proactive with a uh, hydraulic model uh, for understanding what's going to happen in the future uh, is this time series database. And, and so the idea here is to be able to bring in external data sources, um, those different boundary conditions, uh, all in real time to be able to uh, use those in either a scalar or a spatial sense, uh, scalar being things that are um, tied to one area, so that would be more like levels and um, flows and things like that. Uh, but there's also uh, spatial, so being able to uh, model forecasted and observe rainfall. Um, just a better way of being able to organize that data uh, and then also being able to scrub that data before it gets ingested and put into uh, the model. Um, the advantage of that is in the desktop model, being able to use the observed conditions to model uh, a system and really understand uh, where problem areas are. So not necessarily uh, this idea that, you know, we have to model predicted uh, change in climate, uh, but that we can um, take out that uncertainty by really just modeling what's coming in uh, on different types of time horizons. Of course, forecasts, you know, seven days ahead of time uh, can be a lot different than when they're just one day ahead. Um, but the idea here is, uh, we can start to form a plan and start to um, put our um, interest in the best place. Um, ultimately, what this type of thing leads to is just better public perception. Um, the public is more likely to trust warnings if they're given on a percentage, 
Uh, I don't know how many times I've uh, heard a weather alert and thought nothing of it, um, but if you're able to quantify that in a little better method, uh, that can lead to better perception for sure. Uh, some of the examples uh, that I have for uh, how to be proactive with it, um, we've recently uh, completed a case study with the uh, Pacific Valley uh, Sewerage Commission, uh, which is in part of New Jersey, where they're operating a fairly large uh, sewer system, and the idea was to proactively uh, maintain their sensors, and then also, um, if they did have gaps in the data, to use the monitoring data to uh, help with things. Uh, the real challenge with all of this was being able to take their planning level model uh, into one that could be used in a real-time modeling sense. Um, and with that, we were able to help them, um, and they had to do it in a very short period of time on a very large system, uh, and we were able to help them with that by automating uh, the process of calibrating things, uh, calibrating those dry weather flows, uh, using Python scripts outside of the um, modeling software they were using. Um, another example I've got is in, the, in Southern Water in the UK. Uh, basically, this is a coastal community that had a very a steep and short hydrologic response. Uh, there were some large diesel pumps that um, whenever they had quick surges, they couldn't really um, adapt. And so as a result, they were being reactive instead of proactive. Uh, this led to uh, pretty significant amounts of damage. Uh, of course, it's not a problem, or you don't want to fix it until it becomes a problem. Um, so they did have some major flooding where um, it was over a 100-year event, uh, and because those pumps were being reactive, uh, they couldn't quite uh, keep up, and it, the uh, storm ended up damaging all six pumps that they had, uh, and they had uh, over 300 properties uh, with a lot of damage, as well as some more that had uh, external uh, flooding associated with it. There was another one uh, that, you know, the, the pumping station uh, filled up very, very quickly, uh, the equivalent of 7.7 .7 million gallons uh, within four minutes, um, and then within 40 more minutes, uh, that level rose um, from this negative 16 uh, up to 28 feet, the equivalent of 11 million gallons. And because of those delays, uh, the pumps only got up to half the capacity, uh, and again, causing pretty significant flooding in this case. The solution to all this was being able to, again, take that time series data, uh, take live forecasted data, be able to run that through their models and understand uh, how that's going to change. And uh, by being able to do that, the operators were able to ramp up those pumps uh, faster um, or, or proactively uh, for the uh, system here, uh, resulting in a reduction of the overflows uh, utilizing the full capacity of those pumps before uh, they get overwhelmed. Uh, another one that I really like is this uh, Glasgow Smart Canals. Um, they do have a website. They are very proud of this project, um, but basically this was a challenge of optimizing uh, flood risk for areas adjacent to this canal. And then also uh, they have some canal navigability requirements in the UK for uh, leisure activities. Um, so the solution to all this, uh, again, was being able to retrieve forecasted data from their SCADA system. Uh, and then that information would get passed back to RTCs to optimize the sweep uh, gate controls and kind of a, a look at what that um, really, um, on more of a simplistic level, um, I did take this from their website where uh, it describes what exactly is going on. So uh, rains, uh, some sensors and things like that kick on. Uh, they have uh, a, a, an alert system to be able to tell them that they need to start draining things. So uh, they had a diversion canal that took water from this canal into the River Kelvin, uh, drained it a certain amount depending on how much uh, rain they were expecting. Uh, and as it came in rain, it filled up uh, different retention ponds and uh, the canal itself. Uh, and because of that, it's, it's uh, filling up that canal level again. And once the storm passes, uh, the uh, ponds drain, the canal fills up, and the water levels are back to normal. So as a result of all of this, they were able to store about 2 million cubic feet of uh, additional storage um, just by kind of using basically a smart pond type of, um, uh, type of uh, thing, uh, being able to manage that stormwater in a um, 
more interesting and proactive way, uh, but ultimately leading to 270 acres more uh, land to be able to be, be developed. Uh, and with that, I, I thought we were going to go a lot further. <laughs> um, but uh, this is our contact information. Um, I guess we'll open it up to any kinds of questions. Um, yeah, thank you both. Um, so at this time, we'll move into the question and answer portion of the program. Um, just a quick reminder, if you'd still like to ask a question, you can still do so um, until the end of the webcast via the ask a question box in your presentation window. Um, we also have um, one other person joining us for the Q&A session. That's Professor Kenneth Strozepek. Um, he is a joint works with a joint program on the science and policy of global change at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So if you hear another voice, um, Kenneth was able to join us. Um, let's see here. So the first question, we got quite a few nice ones that came in. Um, the first one I have here are, is what are the biggest issues for communities to implement more proactive systems to enable more resiliency? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I think some of the biggest issues facing them are, are just the technology and being able to uh, deploy out some of these systems that enable them to be a little more proactive in the sense. Um, uh, I think that would be the biggest one. All right, um, let's see, what types of models are being used to simulate climate change? Yeah, I was going to lean on Katya a little bit there. Um, I don't know if you have uh, what, what kind of statistical models or, or things that you uh, used for your uh, analysis. Um, I know the one that I mentioned, the Monte Carlo approach. Uh, is yeah. Typical, but. Yeah, so um, for the Monte Carlo, this is what we're, I, I haven't presented that. This is something we're currently doing for the manholes, but for the storms, because I see that the, the or the question was more towards the, the storms, it's, it was a whole um, climate change report for, with multi-groups, it's climatologists who basically predicted um, for the city of Cambridge, what would be the future inputs. And those things are actually been used uh, by Stantag, Dewberry, us, the city of Cambridge, the city of Boston, so multiple players. But yeah, it's absolutely crucial, I think, um, to have two things. One is the, the, the most accurate as possible rainstorm predictions, and those would immediately include an uncertainty band, right? And the other thing mm -hmm. is on the resolution of, um, of of your models of the community, it's crucial to get, to understand that it's an ongoing process. So if I simulated something today, but I built tomorrow a structure and another train station that is underground, I absolutely might have changed the whole propagation of the flooding in my city. And more so, I might have even impacted the city next to me. So weirdly, for our case study, we have found um, in multiple occasions very surprising thing. So for one, a lot of the flood water that gets to the areas that I've shown today is actually getting from the city that is adjacent to us. So their, their flood is basically flowing towards us because this is topography. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's, it's very important to always be um, updating your model and re-simulating um, in order to actually know that your community is protected and you have the highest accuracy of knowledge and therefore you're able to go forward and, and plan mitigation strategies. All right, uh, please discuss the roles of local stormwater programs in designing and regulating building and infrastructure construction with resilience and climate change in mind? Yeah, I think, um, so yeah, I think this is a very important question. And I think this is, this should be improving with a much more integrated work approach or a more 
holistic thought where the governance teams, the research teams, the design teams would all and already the maintenance teams would all be working together. And so in order to get actually good good models for prediction, estimates, mitigation, and building, you have to have everyone collaborate together. So it ha it's crucial to have climatologists, it's crucial to have water supply engineers, and civil en structural engineers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, definitely different perspectives and things like that. And um, again, I think just the uncertainty of things, uh, having some something that can be uh, used as a proactive approach uh, can, can generally help there too. All right, let's see. Um, please discuss the best and most appropriate projected precipitation frequency estimate tools um, that local program managers and project designers should use in the hydrology and hydraulic models they use in their design and regulatory reviews if they are thinking about resilience and climate change. Yeah, so again, um, I, think, I mean, sorry. yeah, <laughs> you should go ahead. Oh, it, it ties up again, like, um, yeah, we can look at Atlas 14, CMIT 6, and they all give us a high uncertainty band. And when you look at a model that is large scale for large areas, the, the uncertainty band would be just larger and larger. Um, but if you're able or if we're able to do for large metropolitans, for example, their own, um, their own studies, that would be, I think, more appropriate today. Yeah, and I guess with the no Alex 14, I forgot with the confidence interval that they display underneath there, but um, that should certainly give an indication for um, some of those uncertainty bands that as you talked about. And um, you know, if it's if your if your number is seven, but the range is six to nine, well, that's, that's going to make a big difference between the two. So. Um, Um, is there any plan to calibrate the model? Is this for me the question? I, I'm assuming that's for you. Did you did you yeah. calibrate the model? So, did you validate them? In yeah. Um, so we. It's not that it was calibrated. It was validated. So I mean, okay. one as I said, um, I received the base model. And actually, Stantag, Dewberry, City of Cambridge, MIT, um, Kleinfelder, all, um, and Hui, all attributed to that model. And so once they had the full model, they validated that against the flash flood event from 2010. And um, there's two things about that. One is that that was a flash flood event in the City of Cambridge that was not captured, or the flooded areas were not captured by um, the hazard map that the city had and our model was able to capture exactly those areas of flooding not only in the city itself but also like around mit campus um so that basically assured us that um we have we have a good um representative model Okay, and then I've got another question for you, Katya. Um, where did you obtain your DEM data and what resolution was it? Yeah, so um, I, I did obtain this from the City of Cambridge. This is a flyover from 2018 that is on the resolution of one feet over one feet, which is a pretty good uh, resolution. For example, I think that for some areas in Africa, we only have satellites um dm and that resolution becomes like on the scale of meters tens of meters over tens of meters um so i would say that for all of the us almost the same flyover that i have you can get it in um the gis website of the city of cambridge you have for massachusetts a really great gis website that has a lot of um layers for the state and um, I think that there's, it's, it's getting picked up more and more, but most large 
metropolitans in the U.S. have their own um, GIS website, and you can get a lot of the layers there. So not only the digital elevation, also the building contours. Uh, you can get all the vegetation areas that you want. So it's, we have a lot of data. We should use it. Right, we're getting, still getting some more questions in. So if you've got any more questions you want to ask here, um, use the Ask the Question button. Um, have you considered implementing conservation easements to maintain conveyance flow paths identified as critical through pluvial modeling, a non-FEMA floodway? Um, hmm. I, I, it seems like an interesting no. approach for sure. <laughs> I, just yeah. to comment on it, it does seem like a really interesting approach. I'd imagine in a city like Cambridge, you'd run into a lot of um, real estate and right-of-way and different things that um, don't, don't uh, lend itself easily yeah. to that. Um, I guess as an example, it's just kind of the same thing. I remember um, uh, in Peru, they, were, uh, they have very steep... Um, seed catchments and things like that, uh, and what they were doing was basically building uh, large culverts underneath each one of the roads, and then there were slits in the road, and the uh, crown was actually into the middle of the road rather than uh, how we typically do it here. So it was funneling all that water into this large conveyance underneath the, um, the city. A um, little bit different for this situation, since it's not exactly a, a steep catchment or anything like that, but um, different ways of thinking about things. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and what are the best ways to frame and explain uncertainty in model results and reports that local decision makers need to use for big budget decisions? Um, so, I'm, I think in my view, our, our uncertainty mostly, um, it, we should quantify what is our uncertainty. If our uncertainty is coming mostly from the rainstorm itself, and we absolutely accumulate a little more um, uncertainty within the model, but it's mostly from the rain, then it's important to have that. And since we are talking about rain events and um, in the design as well, in the order of of you know inches an hour or um, prediction of recurrence, we should kind of match that and talk about well this is the annual probability of this place to get flooded or not to get flooded. And mostly I think once we know the propagation itself, it's easier to 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 have the decision making because a study is a holistic. If I mitigated flooding in one area, I basically created it in a different area because unless I drained out my water, it, it's going to remain. So I think it's always going to be kind of this ongoing process where you just improve and improve. Yeah, and I just to add on to that, uh, I think it's it's all about risk tolerance, and, and like how you was saying, it's it, um, if you're able to quantify what that uh, chances are, what that risk is, uh, then that's probably the best way to understand, um, you know, that balance between cost and, and, and um, damage. It's just that difference between, because um, we can design systems to handle, you know, the, the biblical floods and stuff like that, but, um, well, maybe not biblical floods, but... <laughs> Um, we can design things so that we can handle any kind of storm um, to some extent, I guess, but uh, it, it depends on how, how much they want to really tackle that problem. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's more of like a city can choose to know that two areas would flood. It would mitigate one, but it would let the other flood because it's less important or less critical. So having the knowledge would be able to, to, to at least get us to a place where we can actually get the mitigation decisions. Because at the moment, if we are under predicting our floods, we're, we're not aware of our risks. So we are not actually sitting down to decide how to mitigate.
All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, so at this time, um, we have run out of time for uh, the webinar. But if you are interested in receiving a PDF of today's presentation, you may reach out to our presenters afterwards. Um, and their contact info is still on the screen there. Um, any unanswered questions will be forwarded to our presenters to answer offline. So you will get um, your response that way. On behalf of Waterworld and Endeavor Business Media, I'd like to thank today's speakers, Ryan Brown, Katya Bukin, and Professor Kenneth Skrebek, as well as our sponsor, Innovise, an Autodesk company, for today's presentation, Building Community Resilience by Reducing Sewer Overflows and Improving Flood Management. As a reminder, this presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed at waterworld.com for the next six months. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a direct link to the archive. Uh, please take a moment to share your feedback with us by completing the brief satisfaction survey at the end of the session. And a reminder that a certificate of attendance for today's webcast will be emailed to all registrants within 24 hours of today's event. With that, we thank you for joining us today and we look forward to serving you with future webcasts. This concludes today's presentation.